Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much uh, for joining us at uh, a Real Asset Live event. Um, this is the, the fourth event that we've, we've done so far, and this one's particularly focused on student housing, co-living, micro-living. Um, and the session this morning, um, we're going to look at that area, look at the outlook for it. Um, it's an interactive discussion, so please do come with us with questions. You've got a Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be taking questions from you and trying our best to answer them, picking up on, uh, on, on just some of, the, some of the key topics that we've got here. In terms of the session this morning, We've got Samuel Vatrak, Rhino Nonengasser, Douglas Edwards, and Philip Hillman. We're going to start with just telling you a little bit more about what Real Asset Media do. We're running a series of these events. We also run publishing, um, and we've started a number of, of new initiatives um, to help keep people connected and safe during this health crisis. Um, so we've got Realcast, which is every week, which gives an analysis of the, of the key stories of the week. We're running several of these kinds of online events to help share content, share insight with the market. Um, and also, we've launched a series of special reports that we're doing. Um, we've done one on coronavirus, and we're going to do one. We're starting to research it now, um, looking, at, looking at what will be the new normal. Um, and we're doing the research for that and expect to publish that in June. Um, but let's start, first of all, um, just with some, some quick introductions. So maybe starting with you, Reiner, um, just, just introduce yourself just for a minute so that then everybody knows who you are and what you do. Sure, pleasure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Rainer Nonengesser. I'm with International Campus. International Campus is a developer operator in the student housing and young professional sector um, in Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and uh, in the near future also in CEE countries. We run student accommodation schemes, currently got some four and a half thousand beds in operation and another 5,000 in various stages of delivery. Um, our student housing a business runs uh, under the brand The Fizz. We are just about to launch a second brand called Havens, which is a non-student young professional product. And... Uh, we are rolling that out in Hamburg for the first time uh, in the course of this year, and then we'll roll it out to other European cities. Great, thanks very much. Douglas. Uh, good morning, uh, Doug Edwards, Managing Director, Head of Sales and Equity Raising for Core State. As colleagues might know, Core State has been active in the student accommodation micro living sector now since 06. Currently today, 36,000 beds either under management or under development. We both uh, own, develop, own, and manage assets on behalf of third parties on a pan-European perspective. Our home market in Germany, where we originated, but we now, similar to Reina, are now pan-European with significant concentrations in the Iberian Peninsula and also in uh, Pol um, Poland now, where we're moving in. So it's a sector which we feel completely comfortable with and being one of the partners, leaders in the German market, we look forward to participating today. Great, thanks very much. Philip. Philip Hillman, I'm Chairman of Living Capital Markets at JLL, usually based in London, but currently hunkered down in Cheshire, in Northwest England. Um, my work has primarily been in the student housing sector over the last 25 or more years. Um, initially working in the UK, where we have been involved in many of the large transactions, particularly the portfolio transactions over the last 10, 15 years or so. And then more recently have been working across Europe uh, with our colleagues involved in the living sector, as we've been seeing the uh, student housing space become more established across Europe, albeit in different markets at different speeds. Also doing some work in Africa as well with student housing in Kenya and South Africa. Uh, just now beginning to get involved more in the evolving co-living market. Um, and it's, of course, fascinating to, to see how that potentially will be affected by this virus. Great. Thanks very much. Um, and Samuel, just, just quickly from you. So first of all, I would like to say at the very beginning that uh, what I will be presenting about eight uh, slides uh, for the audience are the insights. We are really not in a position to uh, share or have any data. Uh, we are in unprecedented times. 
not comparable to anything that happened to this sector or mobility of the planet before. Uh, however, we have had the opportunity to talk to multiple dozens of stakeholder, stakeholders uh, across the vertical structure of the sector. So government agencies, associations, sector associations, uh, uh, universities, colleges, uh, and then investors, operators, developers, uh, lenders, uh, booking agents. So uh, attended probably 50 webinars related to this topic. So lately in the last three weeks. So what I will be uh, coming from, where I will be coming from is mostly the cumulative knowledge or, you know, um, uh, sort of an address or a hub that we have, uh, we have been so far for all the information and insights from various stakeholders, from a group or individual conversations. So I have first three, three slides on current situation, uh, so some, uh, summer semester, then short-term future, so autumn semester and long-term future. Um, so what we are seeing and hearing, first, different different views and perceptions by segment so investors have different uh, view than operators or developers or lenders there are um, in general more optimistic than their counterparts in other asset classes uh, but uh, the level of pessimism or optimism varies based on uh, where they are in this segmentation in general, deals and transactions uh, paused. So those who, that started before COVID crisis, they, uh, they, they were concluded, most of them, but uh, there are no new, uh, or uh, not that many new uh, deals. It's not uh, well, because of lack of confidence, but much more due practical challenges. Uh, it's difficult to travel, difficult to sign something or do valuation in these times. However, uh, there are opportunistic investors who increased activity, uh, learned the lesson previously, uh, and know the, the, the sector and the asset class. They are confident. They understand that the asset class might be more competitive after this all. So they are using the opportunity to buy for less. Um, rental discounts. Um, uh, that uh, some of the operators uh, tried don't seem to work. That's not the uh, not the problem or solution of the problem. Uh, operators really experience uh, decreases uh, in in occupa occupations uh, occupancy. So uh, some students stay, mostly international students. When we talk to universities in Canada, Australia, UK, Europe. Um, even, you know, Japan or, or uh, Brazil, uh, the long haul students uh, wanted or had to stay. Uh, so many of them are good for the occupancies and operators, uh, less so for future semester, we will get there. But everybody is getting cancellations, obviously, some 10%, some 50% and some have uh, uh, basically abandoned uh, premises totally. But in general, the situation seems to be that uh, uh, the, it's not like a hotel and hospitality sector, that uh, there, are fight, there were fatal dro drops in occupancies. There are decreases, uh, but not uh, fatal or total. Uh, developers don't seem to be that much concerned and continue where and as possible in their, in their projects. Um, institutional investors seem to be having uh, ongoing confidence uh, in, a, in a long term run more than about uh, than, than other sectors like uh, retail or uh, office or hotel and they seem to be in a desire to divest uh, from those asset classes and probably reallocate the portfolio more towards the rental sectors, especially if the tenant is as uh, um, sort of uh, quality and uh, staying as students uh, as they believe so. Short term future, so um, uh, autumn semester, that's probably the biggest question mark about most of the stakeholders within the sector. Uh, so first, uh, there is a crawling uncertainty, uh, especially now when this is an exam time. 
Um, and this is a planning period, so universities need to plan their budgets. Uh, are they going to open? When? What do they need to plan against? And uh, uh, universities are independent in this, uh, so they are not necessarily um, following all the regulations or recommendations of the government, so this is even more uh, difficult that uh, different universities may can make different decisions. It's not high schools. Um, so, uh, but the general consensus is that uh, September or sort of a deferred fall time will be the start date. This is the belief of about 90% of the stakeholders that uh, we have had the chance to talk to or uh, seeing the results of surveys uh, or uh, from, from webinars that we have attended. Um, most of the universities are planning against the U-shaped scenario. Uh, uh, let me just shortly explain. So it's not the L-shaped scenario that the market will drop and remain for many years uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a lower level, like in the 80s, uh, the economy in Japan. It's not a V-shape, so it will it will in, in, increase back as it decreased uh, at the same angle. Um, and they are still believing that that's not a W-shaped scenario, so that there will be a second wave and we will basically uh, start reopening, uh, there will be second wave, uh, new lockdowns, and then only then we will get uh, closer to normal probably in 2021. So far, most of the universities and students seem to be doing their plans against the U-shaped scenario. Uh, the biggest surprise for us so far has been that admissions and accommodation bookings uh, for September or autumn semester not is only slight or no decrease. We talked to the biggest booking agents, talked to operators that have 20 plus properties um, and uh, seem to be having bookings at the same or higher level for September than uh, they had at this time last year. Uh, of course, this might be much more volatile bookings uh, with uh, more relaxed cancellation policies, so it might not convert as it is now in, in the books. Uh, therefore, it is very likely that uh, there will be less students uh, and there are less students expected everywhere that's the general consensus or expectation uh, we're not talking about 50 percent less but probably not even uh, not not 10 percent so something something in between and uh, the the smaller number of uh, starting students in september or fall semester might not necessarily be only due demand that it will be smaller demand but a quite big Role uh, backlogs have quite a significant role in this. So we are an exam period. There are three hundred fifty thousand people waiting for an exam uh, in in the UK that they cannot uh, reach it. So Gaokao in China is postponed by a month. Um, then visa and consular offices are closed. So once they return back then uh, they will have a huge backlog for, so, so international students will have difficulties to come even if there are opening of economies and, uh, and travel. And then flights, there will be limited number of flights. Uh, the price is questionable how affordable they will be. Uh, so um, uh, that might be a significant factor besides demand that will influence the, the uh, mobile students to, to come. Um, also, the exchange programs, the short-term exchange programs like Erasmus or US, US study abroad are expected to be limited in a, in a short-term period. Uh, so those uh, start dates or uh, study, study decisions might be deferred for later and we might not, ex not, not expect so many Erasmus or US study abroad uh, pro students. Um, what we are hearing from almost everywhere is that uh, 2020 slash 2021 academic season or year will be more dependent on domestic mobility, both for universities and accommodation providers. Um, 
So uh, uh, while international students were good for the operators now, as they some some or many of them stayed, uh, they will, the domestic students will be more precious for operators in next semester or two. Um, there is an expectation that uh, where possible, due regulations or, or uh, permits, that the student housing operators uh, will be looking for alternative tenants to fill the occupancy losses, uh, or they will be more flexible towards uh, different lengths of contracts. So if they were selling only 10 months or 12 months so far, they might be open to more flexible length of contracts and occup or occupants. Future outlook. Um, well, the biggest question is U-shape or W-shape uh, recovery scenario. Uh, we uh, uh, provided that we are not, not talking about pandemic, but about the economic recession or depression that might come afterwards. Um, it is generally uh, concluded by many stakeholders. We have had the chance to exchange views that uh, there, there are and there will be more students in and after uh, recession. Since 50s and especially last 20 years, when we look at the dot-com uh, crisis, 9-11, uh, 2008 uh, Great Recession, 2012 bailout uh, crisis, of course, these are nowhere comparable to what we experience now. But the general pattern uh, and the historic track record is that uh, um, it's a uh, economic recession is a natural time to study so there are not less uh, but more students that's why this asset class uh, is considered to be defensive and country cyclical um, so in general it is believed that international mobility and international students are likely to return uh, in long term and then the, uh, what what might however change oh, sorry about that <laughs> Um, uh, the destination uh, preferences can shift. Uh, so uh, um, some destinations, um, be it, uh, for example, Canada, uh, considered uh, international students uh, and treated international students much differently and better than other destinations. Uh, and uh, it is expected that Canada will benefit from it. Uh, and will receive more international students. However, some other destinations might be on the other uh, position. Uh, so in general, uh, Australia, Canada, Germany might be uh, winners of the, the situation for the long term, uh, while uh, some other destinations uh, less so. Not only because how the governments treated uh, the overall situation, uh, but also um, uh, because the overall perception uh, how the governments, associations, universities uh, targeted the communications and the, 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 uh, the audiences, especially the Chinese market, which is uh, uh, prevailing in terms of number of bookings from international markets. Uh, rental levels uh, seem to be we, we don't see that uh, plans to increase or decrease the prices. Uh, some tried that, but it didn't work. Uh, and uh, the planning is really to remain stable in terms of uh, rental levels. Uh, what is a possible scenario for preferences of students towards particular universities or programs or faculties is that there might be a shift. Many institutions, many universities are dependent on international students heavily and they will lose this income as well as on research contributions that they might uh, lose this income uh, as well, especially the UK uh, universities uh, when uh, Brexit is happening at the same time and they might not have uh, so much access to the Horizons uh, 93 billion uh, research program. Um, so um, uh, product, product preferences, uh, uh, we discuss a lot uh, with, uh, with our partners and clients and it uh, seems like uh, there might be a, sh a shift. So studio as a, as a non-shared product might be more on demand than uh, the shared uh, non-ensued rooms. 
um, um, but this is about to be confirmed or not. This is an assumption. Uh, we don't, we, our partners don't see a pattern in bookings yet. Investors and operators remain confident about the long-term returns and student housing seem to be better situated than any other uh, asset class uh, like a retail hotel or, uh, or office. Now, before I go to uh, two graphs that uh, I will share with you, which is a possible feature of the future, uh, please take it with a certain reserve. Uh, nobody knows how it is going to be. This is only based on how uh, as much as we can anticipate and uh, on consensus of uh, dozens of people we have had the chance to talk to. But I will, I will present a U-shape and V-shape uh, recovery scenario and how it might look like later on. Um, so, student housing in general as we can see over here, in terms of international numbers, they grow across the economic recessions. It's a defensive asset class, counter-cyclical nature, and in general, there are more students during and after economic recessions. Uh, of course, as long as we have pandemic, then this is out of question. So, uh, impact on economy and sector, if we are talking uh, U-shape scenario. Um, so on top you can see uh, the development of a pandemic uh, and development of economic recession and the curve then uh, shows the, 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 the U-shape uh, economic recovery with summer to be the bottom of uh, the U-shape and then going back to uh, uh, closer or back to, back to normal. Um, there are some voices uh, that this is only three months thing, uh, but in general, uh, the belief is that this is a six to nine month thing, uh, if you're talking about U-shape, um, and uh, uh, that the mobility uh, will start returning uh, as of ne next semester and uh, back to normal in uh, 2021 with probably September 2021 being at a, at a reasonable, uh, probably same levels as 2019. Um, so mobility of students expected to, to, be, uh, to return or be higher in long term. Um, so it is very likely that the students will return to classes sooner than the economy returns to its normal. And that's basically the counter-cyclical nature. If we are, however, in a V-shape, a W-shaped uh, scenario, so uh, we come to a second wave of uh, COVID, uh, and we return to early, or oh, the pandemic spreads again, then uh, basically we will go, uh, the summer will not be the bottom, but the new high of the, of the crisis. And um, uh, the, uh, the return to normal will be deferred uh, significantly uh, and uh, will probably not return uh, to, to same levels in 2020 or first half of 2021. So we will have to wait longer uh, and uh, uh, economically uh, we might go from recession to economic depression. So economic recovery might be, might be longer. Uh, so the, the overall scenario might be, uh, might be much more spanned uh, across the old uh, academic year 2020, 2021. Last two slides. Um, many have asked us the, to, uh, to talk about the, the opportunities as well. Um, so this is uh, just to feature where the asset class uh, uh, is recently. Um, there are 725 new projects in pipeline uh, to be completed. Those to be completed in 2020 are uh, marked with a light blue in the middle of those uh, circles and the outer circle is the total pipeline, how many beds uh, should be delivered in the course of next uh, two and a half, three years. This is as much as we can see the pipeline. Um, and uh, so there is an opportunity for, for those who have a dry powder and uh, uh, might uh, prefer the opportunistic uh, approach. 
Uh, and finally, trends. So what we see from all of this, uh, 2020 demand will decrease uh, and will be more driven by domestic students than international students uh, uh, when we compare it to previous years. There is sort of an unstoppable globalization trend. There is increasingly more mobility, more flexibility, more renting. Some argue that with the current administrations around the world, as well as this COVID crisis uh, and uh, social distancing, we will, this will sort of hinder the progress, if not stop the progress of globalization and, and global mobility. Uh, but it is really hard to believe that in a, in a context of decades, if not centuries, the overall globalization and increased mobility, flexibility and renting would be stopped entirely or hindered uh, considerably. So it might be, uh, uh, might be a bump in the road or it might be a, a, a permanent uh, trend, uh, the different direction. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, we can have a conversation about that uh, over the course of this uh, webinar. Studying and renting is more on demand in and after economic recessions. Student housing is a counter-cyclical asset class and more investor demand or competition might be expected actually in 2021. We have 700 companies, investors being engaged in this asset class now, which is 200 increase in last two years. We anticipate that there will be more players in 2021. Competition will be uh, stronger and uh, um, and uh, situation might be uh, might be rather different after this. Uh, now it time it's time for some opportunistic investors. What we already see in the recovering Asia that uh, student housing came from the bottom of a preference of investors to be now third most popular, more demanded asset class uh, in their desire to allocate uh, capital. Um, so that's about it, and I hope it has provided some food for thought. Samuel, thanks very much for that great introduction. Lots of lots of information, um, and and lots for us to pick up in in the discussion. Um, Philip, I wanted to just just pick up with you. We've heard a lot there about the the student housing side, especially. Um, you're looking at overall living, if you like. How do you see this within? within the context also looking at micro living and uh, and looking at the co-living side in terms of the wider living sector i think there has been a very positive uh, response from investors towards the private rental sector generally across the uk and europe i think there is a new focus on the benefits of the home uh, the home being now not only where you lay your head on your pillow but also in these times it's become your very you know the, the only place you can go to and it's also for many of us has become our place of work as well and so i think a lot of people are saying actually you know if you look at all the discretionary spends out there the one that is the least likely to be affected going forwards um, during this pandemic period and hopefully after it uh, is going to be anything connected with the home um, in terms of micro-living, um, I totally agree that the student housing side is, is, is definitely a very resilient sector. Come back to that in a minute. In terms of the co-living, um, I think the jury's out uh, at the moment on how co-living will uh, be treated by investors over the next few years. In my experience, and working with my colleagues who are focusing purely on co-living, um, there has been a group of investors who have been skeptical about co-living right from the start, who feel that it isn't really there in any scale, or that there are limitations on what it will be. In reality, it's just a, a hybrid of the other micro-living sectors with a bit more hospitality and communal space. Um, but my personal view, uh, as somebody who's always, I think, felt that co-living has a huge potential part. Uh, going forwards in the way people live is that we are, you know, we are, despite the current upheaval and uncertainty, the word co suddenly doesn't seem very helpful, but despite that, 
Um, we are dealing with increasing urbanization. We're dealing with a population who are less likely to buy, or if they do buy, they will buy later on in life. Um, we're dealing with a, what will again become a very mobile population, and also a population where there is a real feeling of a need for community and a need to share. Many of us have lived in bubbles this last month or so, and I think by the time there is perhaps some sort of way out of this, and hopefully when a vaccine is found, people are going to be even more willing, I think, to potentially see face-to-face -face networking. Uh, and that goes from age ranging, not just for students and young professionals, but also, I mean, dare I say, there might be a, a lot of uh, divorces coming out of this experience of living at home. A lot of people who are going to want to have uh, somewhere to, uh, to, to live where there is still some community. But I think we have to be careful. We have to accept that uh, some investors are going to be nervous about the, uh, some aspects of, of co-living. Uh, it is certainly a little more challenging, perhaps, than it was going to be. On the student side, if I can just come back to that, um, you know, I argued with my colleagues in the early days of this that we'd seen great resilience during the global financial crisis. And I think that was our starting point, was that look how well the sector performed then during a major economic upheaval. Since then, um, we've got this totally new type of crisis. And I think the first thing I've been saying to my colleagues is, this is not hospitality sector. I used to think it was. It is. This is not a discretionary spend. For the vast majority of people, this is a, a very important stepping stone in life. Uh, and that applies whether they're a domestic student or an international student. Um, I think the other thing that strikes me is that we're all having to become amateur behavioral psychologists. Um, will students want to mix more? sooner or later. When the vaccine is out and hopefully working, will there be a very quick return to socialization or will people want to bubble around them? And hence uh, the comment from Samuel about studios as opposed to perhaps a cluster flat where you're sharing a kitchen diner. Um, my belief for what it's worth is I think people, students will quite quickly, after an initial reserve perhaps, they will quite quickly want to get back to them socialization but this really all does depend on that vaccine success which is nothing that us real estate people know anything about so we are very very dependent on the science and on what the medics can achieve there um, i see a lot of consolidation in the sector i think a lot of these student housing players will continue to consolidate and just to recall go back to january of this year we were seeing record um transaction volumes, record pricing. We were seeing record numbers of students, record numbers of international students. So things were looking all set for a really, really strong year. But I think going forwards, um, things will pick up towards the end of this year. Transactions will be happening. And I think come 2021, I agree that towards the end of that session, I'm hoping that international students will be coming back but it does look very uncertain for the international street market in the short term. And everybody seems to be focusing much more on the domestic market. But like Samuel, I agree. I think actually international student numbers are likely to increase in the long term. Um, albeit you have to recognize that there are some affordability issues that for some might mean that they defer traveling abroad or go for a slightly cheaper option. And that's what we'll all be watching really carefully. Okay, good. Um, Rainer, um, I, I want to pick up with you just in a second. I've just launched a, a, a poll just to see um, how much we see the, the drop, uh, the potential drop short term of international students will be. And I'll share that with you with you shortly. Rainer, just, just in terms of, you know, we're all expecting there to be a drop in international students. Um, how much does that impact on you? How much, I suppose, is how much are you looking towards international students and, and how much can be made up by domestic students? Well, I think whilst talking about international students, we also need to be careful on what is the definition and what is the impact on my business or on the relevant business model. I think for the UK, especially for London, international students has a way higher uh, impact than to most of the German and Austrian spots we're talking about. 
in in our context, international students uh, are Chinese for sure, but to a certain extent, European or EU students who come through Erasmus programs or other other sources um, uh, floating around uh, through continental Europe. And uh, my expectation is, and I agree with a lot of what Samuel just said, under the assumption that we don't see a, a second wave and that we are in a U shape, I'm expecting the economy to bounce back <clears throat> end of the year starting and there will be differences in Europe. That means I expect Germany, Austria, the Netherlands to bounce back faster and sharper than the Mediterranean part of Europe, for example. And if you draw a parallel to what we have seen in the crisis of 2008 to 2010, we have seen, especially in Germany, but to a certain extent also in Austria and the Netherlands, a strong inflow of uh, young people from Mediterranean countries um, approaching higher education system with the idea or the hope to find a job afterwards. And I would be very surprised if we wouldn't see similar trends in uh, the next uh, uh, 12 to 18 months, which from a German perspective will lead again to a potential steady and significant increase of international students in the context of it being European source students. Um, on the domestic side, uh, yes, we, we have always had a situation that the sector has been pretty much benefiting from the situation that in Germany uh, you are forced into mobility uh, as a young student uh, due to the allocation system on the universities. And uh, this is definitely continuing. Uh, the big question mark currently is on what is the effect of the uh, corona uh, pandemic on the grading system um, and uh, uh, the, the the federal states handle the current ib uh, um, season in in different ways and uh, to be seen what finally the outcome of this is and always when economy uh, go south the uh, academic uh, ratio has increased so uh, higher education as an investment into the individual's future i expect the trend of uh, people leaving uh, secondary uh, school uh, approaching university will increase instead of being flat or dropping so taking this into consideration I expect domestic flows um, to increase or at least to be stable on the 2019 uh, level, plus the effect that after having gone through the dip and potentially in autumn we will see a dip, I expect also a, a significant increase in international student numbers as just described. Okay, good. Um, I mean, in, interestingly, um, I'll just share the results of the, of the poll. 35% of people think it'll be minus 20% down, basically. 47%, 30% down, uh, but only 18% think it'll be 50% or over um, down. So that's interesting, interesting results there. Um, let me just pick this up with um, with you, Douglas. Um, in, in terms of, of what you're seeing in the market, and I suppose you're your strategy. Um, how are you seeing that? What's happening in terms of institutional capital's appetite for the asset class? I, is it still seen as defensive? Do you think? I suppose. What's your What's your perception um, from somebody investing in this? Well, first, I want to pick up on Samuel's point. Um, I would see this more like the Adidas type of structure rather than a U curve. I see it more of a slow uptick and a sustainable uptick. Situation is very clear. I think Samuel expanded upon it very well. It is a defensive asset class. It's seen as defensive and has proven to be defensive. Hence, uh, when I was in Asia in the beginning of the year, a lot of colleagues in South Korea, Japan, and Singapore were looking at this as well as debt as a natural expansion of that curve. And remember, what we're talking about now is just a short term phenomenon. There's no empirical studies in terms of this scenario. We've been through this. Our sector is too young, and we basically are just making projections based on, with all due respects, gut feeling. 
But I think if you go back to the fundamentals, which again, Samuel and Dean Philip touched upon, the sustainable mega trends on demography and urbanization, irrespective of the age group, you know, we're focusing on the younger age group now with student accommodation, there you will, that will be sustainable and continued. And I totally agree with Samuel's view. This is just a hiccup along the route. And in some respects, it's just the last hooray of the aging population who tried to struggle with these changes in our urban fabric, uh, are acting as a bit of an anchor to some of the thought processes. But going back to your specific point, though, Richard, capital is active in the sector. We have active conversations with value add uh, houses who are wanting to put capital to work, whether we're talking about Poland, Italy, Spain, or the Iberia Peninsula, they see the long-term nature, the undersupply. Philip can tell you from his business, there is a significant undersupply in, in PBSA period. Possibly the UK is an exception, and Philip can talk about that, but I see the UK has been fairly saturated. But then the other aspect is the more of the long-term investors are beginning to recognize it, and we're seeing houses, pension funds, insurance companies prepared to do forward funding now. And so the cost of capital coming into the sector is lowering, expectations becoming more realistic. Uh, the comment from, again, Samuel on rents is perfect. We don't see a dip in rents. We see possibly a stabilization over the next year or so, which means that all the fundamentals from an investment viewpoint are there. You've got demand from the tenant perspective. You've got an undersupply. One thing you have to be aware of, we touched upon it briefly, is the design and shape of the buildings. I think there will be a move to uh, singles away from duplexes. I think there's a lot of work in the spare spaces where premium will be for that social environment. Um, but one thing is we honestly have to say each country is going to be different. You can't, one size doesn't fit all. So you need to have a clearly flexible plan with a flexible pan-European overview so you can adapt when you're talking to an investor or indeed when you're talking to um, students, you have that uh, ability to provide the product they need relative to that local market. Because in these markets, there are different planning, different regulations. And one thing I would say, which we haven't touched on in this current moment, because of the reduction in mobility, some of the developments are taking longer. Just getting you know, the goods in, getting uh, people on site. So one has to say, the development pipeline Samuel showed, I think is fair, but I think that's going to be stretched a little bit uh, from the existing developments, but there will be more opportunities to come. So positive in terms of in, uh, capital flows coming in, both value add in terms of development, but also sustainability for long takeout, not only intra-Europe, but there's a lot of intra-Europe, but also from Asia coming into Europe as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, and thanks very much for all of your questions. I'm, I'm going to come to those now. There's one question, and I'll, I'll do a quick poll on this as well. There's a lot of discussion around online courses, and obviously distance learning has been available for a huge amount of time. But um, like we're doing this on Zoom now, um, does online courses, do you think that's going to have a significant long-term impact? I mean, short term, it could potentially have an yeah. impact. But um, OK, let's pick that up with you, Ryan. You're, you're saying you're saying a definite no. So let's let's see what, what's what's your take on it? Well, I think it's uh, like in other areas. Yeah. Uh, if you take uh, uh, home working, for example, home office. Yeah. There were companies who were massively negative on it Yeah, and have changed their the standpoint now, uh, witnessing, is, is witnessing a situation, it works well, yeah. And uh, uh, we have had uh, online universities in Germany for decades, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, the presence at the university will still be vital and instrumental to the evolution of the individual and not taking into consideration that in, 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 in science-related or medical faculties, it's hard to imagine what the outcome would look like if they would turn uh, uh, full-time on, on online systems. So I believe, yes, uh, there will be uh, further grounds gained on uh, online uh, offers, but in the long run, this will not have a significant impact on how our business evolves. Can I just add to that, if I may, the average age of online is roughly early 30s, 34, whereas yeah. we're looking at a target group for PBSA 
you know, 18 to 24. So this is when you need to look at your stratering on your population, your demography. And Rain is absolutely right. We don't see it as an issue at all. I can go this with, uh, with uh, some uh, findings and uh, internal research we have done. Uh, basically, 55% of international, international students book their studies abroad through education. And there are about 16,000 educational agents in the world which this 55% of bookings is going through. And uh, we have interviewed about 200 agents in China, uh, about 50 in Russia, 14 in Brazil. So uh, the scope is uh, exactly this. You know, it's going to be, on, is online going to be the thing? Uh, is it going to uh, drag down the, the, uh, the demand and steal the market share? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, that there is no demand, agents don't hear from parents and students that they would want it. Um, of course, it might um, leave some kind of a, a, a pattern that there will be blended programs uh, or that, uh, you know, uh, some people will take short-term programs for online. But when it comes to degree studies uh, or exchange programs, uh, there there integral identity is that the experience also not only the class and uh, online cannot give that it only can give the, the, the evolution of class so um, it seems like uh, that uh, short-term programs might be affected uh, but uh, long-term degree programs or, or six months exchange programs uh, th there is no evidence of uh, demand for it uh, and, and, and also the, there is another way around. Online delivery is almost as expensive to deliver for the suppliers, so institutions, as it is to deliver on on-site education. And the customer, student customer, is not willing to pay the same for online than on-site. I talked to a Canadian university, they were expecting uh, 590 students arrive from China and India on uh, May, on first week of May. And uh, uh, 50 arrived, uh, all other postponed to September or January. Nobody took it as an option to to, to course online. Okay, interesting. Um, and, the, uh, and the poll seems to suggest that, that there's some agreement around that, but that yes, there will be um, some impact, but not significant was by far the highest at 61%. So um, that, that's interesting. Um, I'm going to pick up some of the some of the questions as well we've got here that are quite specific, particularly people looking at wanting to look at um, markets specifically. So we've had questions about the outlook for Poland, SEE in general, Greece and Cyprus. Do a quick, I mean, we've all mentioned here that the countries are going to be different. Um, let's stick with Europe. Um, for the moment, but but let's let's just run through um, the countries. We have a lot of uh, uh, work in CE, uh, as uh, Douglas mentioned, that uh, and also Reiner, that uh, basically uh, it seems to be moving in general from US, UK, Netherlands, Germany, Iberia, Italy, Poland, and uh, and we have uh, been working on probably eight really beautiful projects uh, research-wise in, in Poland that I saw and uh, it was uh, very interesting, the numbers play well. So I think uh, we will see a lot of movement now in Warsaw finally, uh, where it's very difficult to get a good plot, uh, but also other Polish cities. Uh, I think uh, we will, uh, Germany will come back on on, on a more prominent uh, spot uh, as a safe haven. So uh, Germany and student housing uh, will, will be more, more on demand than it was like probably three, three years ago. Um, uh, there, will be, there will be strong demand, but more questions about UK, uh, because uh, as Douglas said, uh, it is fairly saturated, but mature. Uh, and uh, so the, I think People will look a little bit more in details and precision and uh, we will take less risk. Uh, I think it will take longer to, to be able to travel to or invest in, uh, in uh, Italy um, uh, for practical reasons, not that the fundamentals would not be there. 
Um, and uh, just as I have the opportunity, I would say it uh, loudly that uh, uh, out of all the countries as a study destination for international students, uh, Canada really stands out. And uh, I think this, is, this will be, uh, Canada was having 17% year on year growth of international students um, uh, last, uh, last years. Uh, they have all the principal fundamentals they need for, for growth. Now they're treating international students as much as they're giving them direct subsidies. They count the online program to their uh, on-site studies to give them work permit and the pathway to immigration later on. Uh, they're sending all positive signals, um, that the, or, or most, uh, more positive signals than any other destination. And uh, they will benefit from what is going on in the U.S. Uh, a lot, like they did uh, after 9-11. Uh, For example, in Brazil, I talked to an agent who has 121 offices. And he said, U.S. had 50% market share in 2000 and Canada 7%. After 9-11, Canada, Canada went to 38 and the U.S. to 9. And Canada has never ever lost a number one market position as the destination uh, study destination market for Brazil. So we might see such a huge destination shift or university shifts because many universities, I was looking at the recent uh, research done by uh, government uh, body that uh, more than 50% of income of some uh, universities is created by international students and international research, which might not be the case any longer for those universities. So they will lose cash, they will lose uh, ability and capacity, personal reputation ranks. Richard, could I yeah. just comment on the universities piece? Because we haven't talked a lot about universities, we've talked more about students and investors. Um, and I think the what happens to universities over the next year or two is going to shape really the nature of the recovery of course in higher education. Because at the end of the day, you should follow the universities. Um, to see really where the investment should go. I'm slightly reluctant to talk about investment in countries. I see it more on looking at cities and cities that have the best universities. The best universities obviously will be pulling in students from further afield. There's a lot of universities in the UK that have relied disproportionately on foreign students that will probably not be able to pull in those foreign students in the same numbers for some time and possibly possibly never again. Uh, and so I think the financial pressures on the universities will be significant. Um, one anticipates perhaps a degree of mergers um, over the next few years as the universities see a degree of competitive pressures. Um, the government in the UK is trying to regulate the way student universities compete with each other uh, in terms of limiting unconditional places. And there is a possibility of a numbers cap also being offered by the university to by the government to control the process. Um, the best student housing operators have tended to focus on the best university cities, the best universities. That will continue to be important. But I do think going forwards, um, th there will be changes in how universities are able to cope with the lack of international student numbers in the short term. Uh, and I think for many operators, the relative success or otherwise of some of the universities that they've been relying on is potentially one of the areas that we need to look at when it comes to seeing what distress there might be. And whilst I absolutely agree this is a very, very resilient sector, there will be some distress from this crisis. There are some operators out there that are relatively small scale, some that have quite a number of development projects underway that are being delayed, um, and you wonder when they will be completed. Um, so there are, without doubt, investors out there who are saying to us, great, can you line up, please, the opportunities for us to have a look at come September, where we want to go out there with a war chest and start buying distress scenarios. At the moment, we're not seeing direct distress. The operators have largely absorbed the rental losses for this summer term, um, and many of them have got good capital lines with their lenders, but there are some who don't have that strength of banking behind them, and some who don't have the strong investors behind them. So we will see um, some distress as we uh, have 
perhaps did see some distress after the global financial crisis. But it will be far, far less than we see in other sectors, particularly retail and, and of course, the hospitality sector generally. I think that's that's an interesting point. Um, there's there's some questions, particularly around Spain as well. I don't know if anybody wants to wants to pick that up. Um, and I think picking up your point there um, about cities, I think is is interesting. Um, but particularly that a lot of the the development plan for Spain was focused around um, international students um, coming into Spain. Um, are there countries that are more susceptible to that? I mean, we've already mentioned the UK, and I think everybody would probably agree with that. Um, but Douglas, um, obviously in terms of core estate, you're looking across Europe. You mentioned going into Poland. Are there any particular cities or countries that you're looking at? Um, do, you, do you think this will act as an accelerator, I suppose, in a way that the, the best universities, best cities will, in fact, attract more people, that this will accelerate that trend? Well, I'm going to pick up and, con and confirm with Philip. It is a city play. It is not a country play. Um, and it's a city, not just the university, because we're talking here not only uh, PBSA, but we're talking micro living as well. And that urban environment structure is very important, irrespective, because it's not just the educational facilities, it's how they live within these communities. So look at a city, look at the dynamics. So to answer your question, there has been a movement from the center. Uh, Samuel mentioned it, Philip's mentioned it, out of the core markets of the UK, out of Germany. We're now seeing a very strong footprint in uh, Spain. We have over 2,000 beds either built or, or, or in development. We're seeing at least a number of major international investors in Spain. We honestly believe that there will be more active activity and expansion but it's city driven but we're also seeing variations on the theme and just touching one area on micro living especially in the spanish environment the in the correlation between affordable living and micro living is getting closer and it could well be that micro living could well be a solution provider for affordable living in certain of these territories then moving into Poland, we're actually in Poland. We're on two sites at the moment. We have a further two coming through the pipeline. We have a significant partner there, as you are aware. And we see Poland is city-driven. We have seven cities in Poland. And we like them for the fundamental dynamics, which Samuel mentioned, which Philip's mentioned, but also the urban infrastructure, the public transport, the communities. This is what you have to look at. And when we talk about international students, if you see the growth in them, yes, they are an important element, but the domestic market is by far the majority of the occupiers of our of properties. And whilst you're playing on this movement, and movement is a significant factor in our sector, it is the domestic. Ryder talked about it already in terms of the German and Austrian market. And so I am not overly concerned about the slight dip in international students. It is finding the right plots and building the right quality of accommodation to, for, to provide the services because there is under supply. Whether we're talking PPSA, whether we're talking micro living, our markets are under supply. So therefore there's a natural balance between demand from uh, occupiers, demand for quality property, and then operational management. And one of the things Philip mentioned, I think, beg your pardon, might be Samuel, that operational management package around it is becoming more key, whether we're talking PPSA, co-living, or even assisted living. Okay, good. Interesting. I just did a quick kind of snap poll there on um, which sector do you think is the most resilient in terms of investment. Student housing coming out at 62%, um, with micro living at 27%, co living at 12%. Possibly a little bit harsh because it doesn't include the other sectors um, where they may all outperform those. Um, but interesting to see. To be honest, Richard, in part, and I, this is where there's a level of education as well, a lot of colleagues and people listening to the web webinar now might not have a full picture of or definition of micro living co-living and therefore their perspective and like philip might have mentioned is slightly tainted because of their either orientation or their country focus philip would you say that um, yes i'd agree absolutely with that um, what i would say um what, i had a number of conversations with some of the main investors in the student sector in, uh, globally over the last month and one of the comments that uh, has been uh, made a few times is that uh, we have seen a shrinking of the delta between the yield for student housing and the private rental sector, certainly in the prime location. So in London, in January, just after the, uh, the acquisition of, uh, by Blackstone of, of IQ, 
um, the yield on the student element was very, very close to where prime PRS would be. Um, and uh, the comment that has been made by several of the investors is that maybe we should ensure that there is still some delta between PRS, private rental sector, builder rent, and the student, that it should never be quite the same because at the end of the day, people still need somewhere to, to sleep, whereas the impossible can happen, universities can shut up. I never thought I'd be saying that. I always thought the biggest risk to our sector was a fire. Well, in London, we had a fire, but it wasn't in the student block initially dreadful. And that caused issues with cladding. And then I thought it would be something like SARS too. Um, we never quite envisaged something on this scale. So you have to accept the risk that in some countries, particularly in the UK with the planning system, perhaps there should still be some difference between that PRS level and the student. And, you know, what, what should it be? Should it be 50 basis points? Should it be 75? I don't know, the market will determine that, but I think that probably it does justify there being some difference. Quickly, in, in terms of rent collection, occupancy rates, um, what, what are you seeing, Reiner, uh, I suppose, across your, your portfolio? So far, so far, we have not seen what you would call a dip. We are still uh, north of 95% rental occupancy. And it's interestingly enough, uh, knowing that uh, the lockdown started in uh, a semester break period and uh, summer semester has been transformed into digital. Um, the, there are still in our houses between 55 and 60 percent of the tenants present. Uh, so there might be good reasons even in these times to stay away from home on, or the family, which uh, also underpins that uh, this is not just student accommodation, it's accommodation. People need a place to sleep and that's their center point. On rent collection, um, we had had a slight increase in delayed payments, but not significant, which also applies to uh, demands for cancellations, or demands for overtime where people were not able to uh, go back to their place of origin when uh, due to the, the travel ban. So, yeah, we see all types of uh, outcome uh, along the, the current crisis scenario, but none of that is significant so far. Just also, um, Rainer, in terms of the, um, there's a lot of questions, and again, I'll open this up to everybody, but there's a lot of questions about um, the format especially, um, you know, suggestions that that you may see more studio accommodation, that there may have to be adjustments in the type of product that's offered. Does that mean that you think there's going to be more, um, I guess, flexibility built in um, going forward in terms of these developments so that maybe there's an option to have it as either micro living or as co-living or as student accommodation and that yes. the sector will begin to blur in a sense in terms of the product? Well, I think we have never had a situation that all markets were equal as regards product design, layout, amenity sets and so on. Yeah, uh, Germany, and this also applies to Austria and the Netherlands, has always been uh, dominated by studio products, which is also due to the lack of history in the asset class. So when we started in Germany some 10 years ago, uh, we were looking around the world of what is the existing product and what is the successful product. And uh, deriving from this, we started with studio layouts in, in, in Germany. If you look in, into Spain or Portugal, uh, where uh, flat sh uh, where room sharing clusters are the dominating product, there might be some hesitance, uh, at least short term, uh, towards these products. And I think developers, operators will have to give it a thought on how to address distancing aspects, sanitary aspects, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and uh, on on the micro living side, I think. Uh, the, the, the product has a completely different uh, source of origin. If you look back to what was the situation uh, in, in the German market before uh, the pandemic, you had an Im imbalance between demand and offer on smaller 
schemes, regardless whether it was student or non-students. You had rising rents, you had rising prices, you had a uh, disproportional move of people within Germany, so-called swarm cities were seeing a lot of inflow and all these factors and underlying you had uh, extremely low, historically low interest rates, you had high liquidity in the markets and all these factors haven't changed due to the pandemic. Yeah? They will see pausing elements. Some of them are on remote. If, if you talk to banks these days, uh, they're doing business. We had a webinar last week uh, with bank participants. They look, they're doing business, but they're more selective. And uh, all these factors uh, will, from my point of view, lead to a situation, as Douglas mentioned earlier, micro living also, from my point of view, is a part of the solution and not of the problem whilst overcoming affordability aspects in booming cities yeah and these booms are also paused currently but uh, we will see them bouncing back in a few months from now um, and I'm, I'm definitely sure this will happen can i just come into one element Raina mentioned uh, operating costs we expect with the mindset change through Corona that we see a higher increase or at least an additional increase in operating costs, which mean that if you are an investor coming in, that line item on your business plans will be flexed at higher because of expectation by the tenants. And also the other thing which we haven't touched upon is changing regulations coming down the line. We haven't even touched upon the EU and the uh, renewable and sorry ESG elements coming down the line. So there are a lot of other impacts coming in, but the operating side is by far a hidden element of cost, but one which is significant. Yeah. Yeah. And one which will again drive mergers consolidation interesting um we're almost at the end of the the time samuel already mentioned um investment opportunities there and that people are looking at uh, also looking at opportunities doug you mentioned the capital um seeking opportunities um in terms of i suppose investment strategy um and specific uh, whether there's specific cities or specific types of city that you think are going to be either more resilient or more attractive moving forward um let, let's let's just start with you maybe, maybe let's start with you doug just when you boil it all down and i'm sure it's an evolving strategy um but what, what do you see there's two elements um we have separated what i call the development side of the equation to the medium to long term holder and we are seeing different capital wanting to take that short-term development risk and take the premium from the development. And then we're now seeing a significant appetite for a pan-European perspective of Core Core Plus, which once established would be open to do forward funding. So there is a differentiation. We're seeing insurance pension funds and global uh, funds wanting to do the long-term, very similar to what Philip and the UK market have in the European context. I think you need to have that um, spread of risk, both from a city basis, but also within that structure across micro living, but focused, or at least a weighting, significant weight on PBSA. And that is what the investors are looking for. Sustainable, long-term income, north of 4% running in cash on cash, total return around five and a half. That is what the, why the market wants, but then the development capital is clearly looking at double digit returns which is possible in most of the expanding markets at this moment with the exception possibly of germany because of the cost of land and the alternative use of land in germany okay good philip same to you um yeah absolutely i uh, would agree with what douglas has said um i think strategically looking ahead um there will probably be an increased focus on the top university cities, which I did allude to a little bit before. Um, I think there will be um, some hesitancy in the UK around some of the old polytechnics, which converted to universities 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, in terms of the wider European opportunities, I mean, I felt that Southern Europe has offered some of the very best opportunities, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, you know, I continue to see as big growth areas Italy relatively late on that curve, but it's really getting going in the land. I see very strong investor interest for those European opportunities. Um, we've still hardly seen anything happen in the Nordics, and I still feel there's great potential there. Um, 
Poland, we've already mentioned, uh, there's been quite a bit of interest uh, and activity, and I see that as a bit now as a hub for wider CE markets. Uh, so yeah, I think you know the outlook is is going to be positive once we have got over the issues in the short to medium term. In the short to medium term, I think people will hunker down, hunker down a bit, um, and some of the expansion strategies may not be um, quite so clear. And some investment committees may be a bit reluctant to go for that next stage expansion into new markets. But certainly investors have said to us they want to focus on markets where they already are. Um, talking, for example, to AXA, who bought the clay portfolio in France, they want to build now uh, to acquire more opportunities in France to build that critical mass. And I think that's probably going to be the main focus we're going to see for the next year or two, I would anticipate, building critical mass in the markets where people already are. Uh, and looking at cost, potential cost savings because it's going to be expensive to run student, as, we, as Douglas has pointed out. Uh, going forwards, I think people will wonder how they can get those costs up and stand to uh, a sustainable level. Um, so, yeah, mergers, acquisitions, consolidation. Okay, great. Rhino. Well, our home turf, as mentioned, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, we believe will come strong out of this crisis and therefore we feel pretty comfortable in our continent uh, or our geographical setup currently short term for sure we're looking for opportunities if any uh, i would not be over enthusiastic that uh, there are endless opportunities uh, as regards price dips out there there might potentially be some who are closer to the hospitality segment, which is suffering as all over in, in, in Europe pretty harsh currently. And there might be some developments uh, that might be stuck in that sector. And we will look uh, to find those out of these whom we can transform into micro living slash student accommodation use that will be, let's say, uh, the the challenge and task for the next weeks and months. But uh, uh, as soon as we have uh, gone into 2021, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will see uh, Germany and their neighbours uh, in, in a well-positioned shape. Okay, great. Samuel? I think after we will overcome the difficulties that the 2020 has, uh, has brought us all across, I think that uh, I see a lot of reasons why this asset class might be more on demand, there might be more interest and appetite to invest. Um, I agree with Douglas that, uh, especially from institutional investors, that we will see attempts for pan-European uh, um, projects. Uh, so we will see more holiday inns and crown plazas and sofitels of student housing uh, to invest in core core plus uh, and in uh, benefiting from this pan-European uh, story. Um, I think private equity will be opportunistic as we are already receiving these calls now, uh, but even more so uh, in 2021 onwards, as uh, there are many uh, opportunities uh, and might be, it's not only about distressed properties, but uh, um, and, uh, I, I hope I will have a chance to talk to Rainer Douglas Film later on on this, but what we are experiencing is that uh, uh, student housing will not have so much competition from other asset classes when purchasing land, when uh, you know doing uh, bids for for the buildings. Uh, uh, now you know if you wanted to buy something in Munich, you you were against the very heavy competitors, and it was impossible. But in 2021, many more locations might become available uh, with less competition. So um, I think that. Uh, uh, with more looking at the opportunities, then student housing might be in a in a very uh, relatively good position. I don't think there is any rosy picture, but uh, it might be better in student housing than other asset classes. 
Great. Um, thanks very much to, to all of the speakers. Um, thank you also to all the attendees um, for joining us for, for your questions. In terms of the events that we've got coming up, um, as I mentioned, we'll be covering ESG, but tomorrow morning at 9.30 UK time, we're looking at innovation districts and how they play a role in terms of winning cities and investments, particularly linked to healthcare, data collection, those kinds of things. Thanks very much to everyone for joining us. Um, do stay safe. Um, glad that we could share these insights with you um, and looking forward to the next one. Uh, thanks very much to all of the panel and thank you for attending. Yeah.